You know, it, uh, he has waited for us to get right. He's given us time. He has extended time. You know, sometimes people are, are wondering when Jesus is going to come back. And Scripture even tells us that he is being patient, wanting us to come to repentance you're the only reason we exist today is because God doesn't want us to go to hell. Otherwise, this world would be done and over with. This, this whole life would be, be complete. Um, that's the only reason. It's because he is waiting uh, for us to come to him. And so we're going to start this morning looking in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 through 22. It says here, it says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. There is also an antitype, which now saves us, baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God. Angels and authorities and powers have been made subject to him. You know, as I was reading this, I was just thinking how patient God is. Because, you know, it talks about here that this, uh, it's a worded kind of weird for us to understand. But he says, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared. What he's saying is, is that, that God was patient. They, it took around 120 years for the ark to be built. 120 years, that's a long time to wait. He waited 120 years for eight souls. For only eight, that he was, he was willing to wait that long. And, you know, I, I was talking uh, with Emily and her boyfriend the other night about uh, times I've come close to dying. You know, things that I've, I've done and, and instances where I probably should have died. And I think a lot of us have, have some stories along those lines of saying, you know what, I, I had these, these things happen in my life, and uh, most of those things happened before I got saved. You know, most of the things that, that were almost to death or almost, you know, life-ending scenarios were before I got saved. You know what, I am thankful that God was patient. He saved me through those situations. He waited to ret He's waiting to return. He gave me time to get right. He gave me time to come to this, this point of repentance in my life, the point of, of knowing Jesus and making Him the Lord of my life, and so that I could be forgiven. He waited, and He protected me through that. Unfortunately, sometimes people think that, that God's going to keep doing that until they run out of time. Some of you may have heard, but most of you probably have not, that uh, those of you who know my son Matthew, he was involved in a major accident yesterday, and somebody died. Um, he, was, he got rear-ended. It fl flew his Jeep into another lane, oncoming traffic. That rear-ended him again, and the guy in that car it took the top of the car off. Independence, Missouri. But Matt is okay. Yeah, he's he's fine. He's he's shook up, but he's okay. But you know what? Yeah, yeah. And so this is, you know, that that other guy. He was just driving in the other lane, and in the blink of an eye, his life was over. His time ran out. We have no idea whether he knew Jesus. But you know. We need to be thankful that God's been patient with us to this point, but we need to also need to recognize we're not guaranteed our next breath. Because he waited for Noah to build an ark. 100 to 120 years for eight souls. 
If that's not patient, I don't know what is. We have a hard time waiting 120 minutes for something. All right? That's even a real long time, especially if you go out to eat or something, right? That's two, that'd be two hours. We'd get up and leave. But he waited for you. He waited for me. And he waited so that we could be saved. In 2 Peter 3, 9, it says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Scripture makes it very clear here. God's not slack in his coming. He's, He's not wasting time. He didn't forget about us. It says here that he is waiting. He is being patient. Long-suffering means to be patient. He is being patient with us. He's being patient with humanity because it's not in his will that anybody goes to hell. We need to hear that this morning because it's not God's will for anybody to go to hell. It doesn't matter how bad they are. It doesn't matter the things that they've done. It is not in the will of God for anybody to go to hell. Sometimes people think of God up there as this big mean judge just wanting to send people to hell. He doesn't want you to go to hell. That's why we're still alive. That's why we're here today, because God does not want anyone to go to hell. He doesn't want you to go to hell. He wants you to repent. He wants people to repent. He wants the world around us to repent. You know, I know we, we all can look out the windows here, uh, so to speak, and you know what? We see people that that maybe we'd like to see go to hell, but God doesn't want to. Being blunt, there there are people in the world that we we just think that no matter what, God should not forgive them for the things that they've done. But that's not God. He wants them to repent, and he's being patient. In Acts chapter 17, verses 24 through 31 here, it says, God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives all life, gives to all life, breath, and all things. He has been he has made from one blood every nation of man to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined their pre appointed times and their boundaries of their dwellings. Get this so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of our own poets, I'm sorry, some of your own poets have said, for we are his off, also his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, We ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given given assurance of this, to all by raising him from the dead. You know, a, uh, God has set the times, the boundaries, everything in your life in hopes that you would start seeking for him. In hopes that you would, it says to grope, trying to find him, like trying to find the light switch in the dark, that you're looking and you're feeling, you're searching. He says, I've put these things in your life I've put you in the place where you're at, in the time that you're at, in the situation that you're at, so that you'll look for me. That's what God is saying. He says, I want you to look for me. And and I'm controlling things around you in your life to in the hopes that it's going to get your attention to say, you know, I need to find God. Even if I don't know where to find him, I need to start looking. And I need, And he says, you know what? He's not far from any of us. But... It, Sometimes we look at life and we think life is not fair. We think that, you know, we are, maybe we're jealous of other people. We, we do whatever it is we do, but we just think, you know, man, life sucks. And, and God's just saying, you know what? All you got to do is start looking, start feeling around. 
because you're going to find me because I'm not very far from you, but you need to look. And, and the situations that happen, I really believe that there are, that God ordains the situations and the things that happen in our life to cause us to look for Him. You know, people who don't know Jesus probably think more about Jesus at a funeral or when they're facing their own mortality. When we're faced with the eternity, recognizing that this life is not going to last. That's when people often start doing the groping. You know, um, another place a lot of people find Jesus is in prison. You know, when they recognize that all of a sudden their life has come crumbling down to this point here, and they say, you know what, I got nowhere else to go. I think you really got to believe that God put you there so that you would start looking for him. He's called us to repent. You know, he, uh, it tells us here that uh, once upon a time, God overlooked ignorance. You know, he, he, Paul's writing here and he, he's talking about, I'm sorry, Peter's, which one is it? <laughs> uh, it's Paul, actually, Luke is writing, but Paul's talking. And he's, he's saying, you know what? There was a time when men worshiped idols and God overlooked their ignorance. He says, but that time has passed. God's no longer overlooking this ignorance. Now he has commanded, he says he's commanded every man to repent. He wants everyone to come to repentance. You know, I, the things of God are, are you know, as far as how he's going to judge and things, they're more complex than we could ever understand. But I do know that Scripture makes it pretty clear. That, that we are also going to be judged based on what we know. And when we know what God wants for us, and we don't do it, we put ourselves in a position of a stricter judgment. You know, he's saying that the times of, of uh, doing things ignorantly are now over. Now you know, and you're responsible with, what, with that knowledge as to what to do with it. He calls us to repent of our sin, of our selfish ways. He tells us, that uh, that is that time is now. There's going to be a judgment day. You know, Paul's bringing this up. There is going to be a day that we're going to be judged, and uh, he tells us that we have an assurance that this is going to happen because Jesus rose from the dead. If Jesus hadn't rose from the dead, none of us would be here this morning because none of this would mean anything if Jesus hadn't rose from the dead. But he did. You know, this is a, when we talk about repenting and, and whatnot, the word repent means to turn around and go the other direction. You know, one of the things I, I, I teach about at Teen Challenge sometimes about dealing with repentance is sometimes people think repent means you're sorry for what you did and you're making a decision to stop doing it. That's part of it. But it means to turn around and, and go the other way. So it means whatever it is that you were previously pursuing if you repented of it now all of a sudden you're going to be pursuing the opposite okay when it talks about repenting here it's talking about that we quit going the ways of satan and that we're turning around and we start seeking god we start seeking holiness we start seeking purity we start seeking to be righteous we start seeking the face of god we're we're seeking we're going in the direction god's going not going in the direction we were going it's not a matter of just stopping where you're at. It's a matter of moving in a different direction. It's a matter of, of rowing upstream to go against the current of this world, but going to the source. And uh, so when we repent, you know, a lot of this has to do with, with dying to ourselves. We hear this a lot, but, but I think a lot of people struggle to understand what that means when it says to die to ourselves. So uh, in Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 through 26, it says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? See, Jesus here, he's talking about taking up our cross 
and following him. He's saying, you know what, if you want to experience life, and, and what he's really implying here is, is eternal life. He says, if you want to get there, you know what? This life can't be about you now. It's about putting down those things that we desire. Sin is obvious, right? Uh, but I think there's so many things that Satan uses that are not sin in and of themselves just to simply draw us away from God. And, and you know, there's we all have have things that we enjoy, we have hobbies, we have different things in life. But Satan will you try to use those things to draw you away from Jesus, to draw you away from your focus. Because when we lose our focus, we get lost. If we're not paying attention to where we're walking, if we're not paying attention to where we're driving, we wind up lost. If we get, you know, something, ooh, something shiny over here, and we go off our path to go find it, the shiny thing in itself isn't necessarily sinful, but it's something that Satan will use to lure you away. You know, I, th I think of this as a, it's, a, it's putting to death the works and the desires of our flesh. So in other words, the things that we, we want in this, this life, uh, it's a lot like fasting, right? Fasting is simply telling yourself no. You know, saying no, I don't need that. No, that's not good for me. No, I don't do that anymore. No, that's not not permissible for me. And and it's uh, I mean everybody loves to fast, right? Uh -huh. Right. Nobody loves to fast. Um, it's not a fasting isn't fun. But as we deny our flesh, it strengthens our spirit. We we become more in tune with God. We become stronger in our resolve to do the things that God's called us to do. We become stronger in our resolve to not give in to temptation. Uh, I, I believe it's one way that we receive wisdom from God to, to go on with life. But how, how do we do that? We do it by telling ourselves no. So we silence the flesh so that we can hear the Spirit. I'm telling you, if we hang on to our past, if we hang on to the things of the world, we die. Right? That Jesus made that pretty clear. He says, you know what? If you want to, you try to save your life. In other words, you want to want to keep this life that you're in, you're going to die. He's talking about a spiritual death. Um, I know some of you have probably heard this before, but uh, I thought this was so profound. Something the Lord shared with me years ago. I had a pair of jeans. And I got a hole in them, and I'm cheap. And so I thought, well, I'm just going to get an iron-on patch and keep these jeans. But then when I got to looking at my jeans, the rest of the denim was thin enough. You held it up to the light, you see light through it. I come to the realization I didn't need a patch. I needed a whole new pair of jeans. You know, there's a lot of people that come to Jesus wanting him to be a patch. You know, Jesus even talked about how nobody puts a, a, a new piece of cloth on an old garment or says, I and mean, if he does... It, that the patch pulls away and makes the tear worse. You know, the fact is, is Jesus refuses to be a patch on our life. He is the whole patch, or he's a whole pair of jeans. He's a whole new life. And, and that is something that we need to, to come to a, a point in our lives that we understand that, you know, in my, in my time in ministry with Teen Challenge, I've seen so many guys come in over the years. They just want God to, they just want Jesus to fix their relationship, fix, fix their addiction, fix the problems, fix the court stuff, but they don't want to give up the rest of their life. Why? Well, it's just like my blue jeans that I had. You know what? They were broke in. They fit good. They were comfortable, right? We all get jeans like that, right? We're like, that's the pair that fits right. You know, that's the pair we like the best. So we wear them so much they wear out faster. That's what happens to me, right? And so, but, but God is... He's saying, you know what, you can't, you need a whole new life. And the only way to do that is to throw the old pants away and get a new pair, to start over. And, uh, and that's what, what really dying to ourselves means is, you know what, but those other ones, we liked them. They're comfortable, right, and they fit right. And, and so, so many times we just want to hang on to our old life with just fixing the problems. But Jesus doesn't work like that. Jesus gives us a whole new life, not just being a patch to our problems. 
You know, when we, when we come to Christ and we make him Lord of our life, one of the things that we do is we, uh, we join together with Jesus in his death. You know, Scripture makes it pretty clear. There's a lot of, a lot of Scripture that talks about how, how, you know, that we died with Christ, right? And, and as we're going to be having our baptism service this morning, you know, baptism is a sign that we have chosen to die to ourselves, to die with Jesus. The word baptize means to immerse or to, to submerge. And so, you know, for those, those that are going to be getting baptized, you know, it's important to recognize what this is symbolizing is this joining with Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, that you're dying to the old man, that that old man is now dead, and it is that you are being immersed in Jesus. You are participating in his death, his burial, his resurrection, and his righteousness. That, that as the, the, the whole baptism service is symbolic of something that has already taken place in one's life. That, that they have chosen to, to die to themselves, to take up their cross, to lay down their desires, their wills, their, their passions, their sins, lay it all down as dead but being resurrected to a new life in Jesus Christ. To being immersed into Jesus, to be sharing in his death and resurrection. And as we're, we're immersed into Jesus, there's a whole lot of scriptures that talk about in him. Saying, telling us that, that if we are in him this or in him that. And so I want to look here for a moment at Colossians chapter 2, verses 11 through 15. It says, in him, you were also circumcised by the circumcision made without hands, by the putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in that you, were, that you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven all your trespasses, having wiped out the handwritings of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. He has taken it all out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them you know he uh he's talking about here he's saying you know what you've been when we've been come to christ and and the baptism is symbolic of all this that, that's taking place here he says you've been buried with him in the baptism you were also raised with him through faith in the working of god he's saying you know what you were once dead you were dead, spiritually dead in your trespasses. In other words, you were dead in your sins, and this was the condition that you lived in. He says, even though you were dead, he has made you alive together with him. He's talking about with Jesus. Jesus' physical resurrection, well, I, there will be a physical resurrection of the dead in the future. This right here is pointing to the spiritual resurrection that, that a person comes to spiritual life. This is where we get the term reborn again when Jesus talked about this with Nicodemus. He's saying, you know what? It is a new life. It's a new life in Jesus. The old is dead. You know, he goes on here and he's talking about, he says, he has forgiven us all our trespasses. There are sins are dead. The past life is dead. Everything that was is dead. He says, but now you've been made new. You've been resurrected to a new life. You know, one of the things that is, that is really awesome about this that he gets into here, he says that he's wiped out the requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. He says he's taken them out of the way and he nailed them to the cross. What he's talking about here is, is the requirements of the law, of the Old Testament law which was impossible for anybody to keep. 
There's a reason we don't keep sacrificing animals today is because Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice. He wiped that out. He also wiped out the, these laws that we couldn't keep. He, he took out the requirements and he has given us his righteousness that we're able to stand before God as righteous because of Jesus' righteousness, because he was sinless. That is how we stand before God as though we're righteous because we know we know ourselves. We know that, that, that we struggle in life, that we're never going to be perfect. It doesn't mean we don't aim for that perfection. We don't justify the sin. We don't justify doing the wrong things. But the fact is, is that he wiped out all the legal requirements. He wiped them out, and he says he made a spectacle of them. He took, it, he took out the principalities and powers. In other words, he took out, he took away Satan's power. He took, out, took away the power of sin and death. Those powers no longer exist for those who are in Christ Jesus because he made a spectacle of them. In other words, he made fun of them. He says, you know what? I wiped him out so bad I made it this public spectacle for everybody to see that Satan's a chump now because the blood of Christ is on my life. He's taken away the power of sin. He nailed it to the cross. You know what that means? That means we have freedom. Because that was one of the things that kept us, sin was what kept us in bondage. Sin's what kept us away from God. And that's been taken away. The requirements of the law, the, the, the bondage that we were under has been taken away so that we are truly free in Christ. That we are free because he's disarmed the devil. He took away his power. You know, as believers in Christ, we need to understand that Satan don't have power over us. He doesn't have control in our lives. We don't have to submit to him anymore. In Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, it says, Or do you not know that as many, as of, many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through, the, through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. You know what? If we've been saved, we've, we've died to our old man, our old person, and we've resurrected with Jesus, he says, you know what? It's a new life. It's time to walk in that new life. It's time to act like you have a new life. It's time to, to live it, not just say we possess it and act like it's not there. He's given us a new life. I tell you what, Jesus, his work on the cross has given us the ultimate clean slate. He wiped it all out. He wiped out a, a, the slate that there's nothing else, in the, nothing we could do in this world wipes it out like that. There's nothing. But he took it all. So in 2 Corinthians 5.17, it tells us, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... He is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. If you are in Christ, that's the key. If you are in Christ, the old is dead. The old person is dead. And everything is now new. You don't live with the stains of your, of your previous actions. You don't live with the... Now, quite frankly, there's going to be people in the world that are going to still try to hold some stuff against you for a while. You know, and... Man, what an opportunity, though, to show the world what Jesus has done in your life, that you've given you a new life. Um, you know, so, so this morning we are going to be having our, our baptismal service here in just a little bit. And in Matthew 28, 19, Jesus told us, he says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Now see, Jesus told us that we're supposed to make disciples and that we're supposed to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. You know, water baptism is in the Assemblies of God is one of two church ordinances that we observe. Okay, in, in some other denominations, you're going to hear the word sacraments. Um, but in the Assemblies of God, there are two ordinances of the church that we, we adhere to. 
And one is water baptism and the other is, is communion. And I'll tell you why. Because these are two things that Jesus told us to do. It's pretty simple. Jesus said do it, so we do it. You know, these, uh, this water baptism is an act of obedience. The, uh, there's nothing special about the water. You know, it is a matter of obedience. Jesus said to be baptized. It is a, it's an outward symbol of what's already taken place in a person's life. And so this is, it's, it's simply being obedient. You know, I, I do believe that it's an opportunity for one to really grow in their faith because I believe beyond the shadow of a doubt that when we do what Jesus told us to do, our faith will grow by it. The water doesn't save. The water is it's simply a matter of being obedient and making a public testimony of what Jesus has done in someone's life. It's making a public testimony of saying, I have decided to die to myself through Jesus Christ and be resurrected to a new life. And this is what has happened in my life, and I'm declaring it to the world that this is what's happened. It's a public testimony. It represents that a person has repented of their sins. They've asked Jesus to forgive them and to be Lord of their life. As they die to the old man, be married with Jesus, and resurrected to new life in Jesus. This is a, it's an important day. You know, this is a, there are, as we talk about baptism, you know, I wouldn't say that baptism is, is required for salvation because we see the thief that was hanging on the cross next to Jesus. He never had the opportunity to be baptized, but yet Jesus said he'd be with him in paradise. But I do believe that if a person has gotten saved and they've received Jesus as their Lord and Savior, they should be baptized because that's what Jesus told us to do. I don't think it's something that's optional for the believer. You know, I think it's a matter of obedience. It's pretty hard to call Jesus your Lord, which means master, and then say, you're my master, but I'm not going to do this one thing you told me to do. One of two things that you told me to do, I'm not going to do. And so I really want to emphasize the importance of showing that water baptism itself doesn't save, but it is an evidence that a person has made that choice in their life because they're willing to be obedient and to that public testimony of, of declaring what God has done in their life. So, you know, this morning, um, it's important to, to be, remember that God was patient with you. He's still patient with you. You know, he, uh, but time will run out for all of us eventually. I hate to be, to spoil the end here for you, but nobody makes it out alive. And we don't know when that time is, just like that guy that, that was involved in that wreck yesterday. That was a blink of an eye. Gone. We never know. We don't know when Jesus is coming back either. That's another hourglass that's running out of sand. But he's been patient. But he's also said, you know what? I've been patient with you, but time's up. Now it's time to repent. Now it's time to get your life right. Now it's time to take up your cross and to die to yourself. The funny part about it is, is that as we die to ourselves, we find life. We find freedom. We find all the things that we search for in death. You know, if, we're, if you hear what I'm saying here, all the things we search for in trying to hang on into this life, which leads to death, all the things that we look for in that, we find by laying our lives down before the Lord and just making the decision to live for Him and to share in His death. Um, as we, we die to our flesh, we get to walk away in a new and resurrected life. You know, this is, a, again, for those that are getting baptized here, this is simply a public testimony of what has already occurred in their life. And so um, the guys are going to come up and share this morning just a little bit about why they're getting baptized. And so 
Caden, you want to come on up? Making me nervous here. How's everybody doing? Uh, my name's Cade. Uh, I guess make it short and sweet is I, uh, since I was about 21, I started using drugs and alcohol and masking my, my real feelings and doing things my way. And I guess I made a commitment now to follow Jesus, and that's what I'm going to do. So that's what all I got. Thank you. Josiah? My name is Josiah, and uh, the reason that I decided to get baptized was because all my life, since I was 11 years old, I was rebelling and doing uh, smoking, drinking, doing all, uh, rebelling against my parents. And uh, um, now that I am 18 years old, I just I did I asked Brother Peter about getting baptized, and he told me that that could be possible. So just recommitting my life to Jesus and just giving him all that I got. That's all I got. Amen. <laughs> yeah, so we, uh, we're, we're rejoicing in, in what God's done in these men's lives. You know, he's, uh, he's turned them around. He's put them on a, a new path, and these guys, uh, while they're not real comfortable up here, but they made the decision to die to themselves. And, uh, and give their life to the Lord and making that decision to follow Him the rest of their life. And so uh, here in a few minutes after we close uh, our service here, we, uh, we can, uh, we're all going to, again, meet at the south end of the building here. And uh, you guys are going to take the polar plunge. <laughs> so we hey, were throwing some hot water in there this morning, trying to warm that water up a little bit. <laughs> so we're... Uh, <laughs> yeah, we're... But we're gonna make it make it pretty quick. Uh, try to avoid any hypothermia. So uh, let's uh, let's close in a word of prayer this morning. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we just thank you once again for your goodness and grace. We thank you, Lord, for your patience you've had with us. Lord, uh, we rejoice, Lord, that uh, that you were patient with these these two young men, Lord, as they that you gave them time to to finally recognize their need for you. Lord, I'd ask that you would make this day a memorable moment in their life, Lord, that it's a, that it's a, a continued turning point, Lord, that it's an opportunity that their faith would be built up as they, they are taking acts of obedience, Lord, in following what you've told them to do, Lord, and just declaring to the world that you are their Lord and Savior, and that they are committed to following you. We thank you for that, Lord, as we... Uh, as we get ready to go out and we go our different ways later, Lord, I'd ask that you just be with each and every person, Lord, that uh, you would bring us back again with words of your testimony, your goodness, and your grace. I would give you thanks and all the praise this morning in the name of Jesus. Amen.